Latin American countries are blessed with natural wealth and majestic landscapes, but it is also riddled with poverty and inequality brought about by many years of bad governments. Dictatorships, revolutions, and populist leaders have often made good governance impossible in Latin America. Their efforts are dedicated to stay in power at the expense of the solution of the social and economic problems of their countries. Crime runs high in these regimes. In Venezuela today, more than 12,000 men and women are killed violently every year, many of them at the hands of government police forces. Of the 10 world countries with most kidnappings during 2007, five were Latin American, Venezuela, Mexico, Colombia, Haiti, and Brazil. The main reason for the recent increase in Venezuela kidnappings is the effective anti-terrorist campaign of the Colombian government, combined with Venezuelan President Chavez's alignment with the Colombian terrorist group of the FARC. As a result of Colombian government efforts, the FARC has been significantly weakened and some of its most notable hostages, such as Ingrid Betancourt, were liberated during 2008 in daring commando operations led by the Colombian army. There are 200 million people living on $2 per day or less in Latin America. That's 200 million out of 500 million people. Poverty is a symptom of the problems of Latin America, including corruption. One of the reasons why people are poor is because of corruption, but there are others. There's lack of opportunity, lack of uh, mobility. In fact, Latin America today is in danger of becoming the worst continent next to Africa for social mobility and economic upward mobility. People are stuck in, the, uh, in, in levels of poverty and they cannot get out. And that's where the demagogues like Hugo Chavez uh, or Evo Morales or others appeal to them. It's going to be very difficult to bring about consolidated democracies in Latin America if Latin American countries do not first address the problem of inequality. Most of these messianic leaders become dictators, eliminate democratic institutions, and try to stay in power indefinitely. They repress all political dissent and exclude significant portions of society from decision-making. Socialist rhetoric appeals to a lot of people still in Latin America, although they're not really sure how to set up a socialist economy. And they feel that that uh, probably uh, wouldn't work very well. So they like to talk about it and uh, not really uh, implement it. They're, they're drawn to saviors, they're drawn to heroes. Viva el Frente Miranda! Viva! Viva la Revolución Bolivariana! Viva! Viva la Unidad Latinoamericana! Viva! Comandante Chávez! When Chávez came forth in the 1998 campaign, what did Chavez say he was going to do when he got to uh, be president, all right? He said he was going to eliminate poverty and he was going to eliminate corruption. And that he was going to take, make the oil industry and the oil benefits um, redound to the barrios, to the public, to the, to the people who had been denied in, the, in this huge income gap um, in uh, Venezuela. Who could not be happy with that, actually? because they, they sing these siren songs of, uh, you know, of, of oppression, and you, you poor people are oppressed because of the oligarchy or the rich people, that they don't understand that the solutions that the Chavez's and the Morales's and the Castro's and the others have been proposing are gonna make the problem worse. You had a revolution in, in Cuba that was very inspiring to people 
So you had this sort of uprising for uh, socialism, a long period when there were military governments that repressed that. Gomez ruled Venezuela for 27 years, and Perez Jimenez imposed a military dictatorship for 10 years. Pinochet was in power in Chile for 17 years. Juan Velasco Alvarado imposed a leftist military dictatorship in Peru for almost 10, while rightist Rojas Pinilla did the same in Colombia. Nicaraguan Caudillo Somoza ruled the country for 20 years, while Trujillo dominated the Dominican Republic for 18. Juan Perón and his wife Evita controlled Argentina for 11 years until displaced by military strongmen. The most dramatic example of this political tragedy was Fidel Castro, who remained in control of Cuba for half a century. We're going through something right now in Venezuela that uh, we already went through in Cuba, uh, although I don't quite remember it. I would, but I was, I was born in Cuba and uh, we had to leave the, the island when Castro came into power. Castro came into power um, uh, with lies, saying that he was not a communist and that there was going to be elections soon. Um, and people believed him like people believed uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. So we had to leave Cuba. We, we left in the last big ship. Uh, my two brothers, my parents, a dog and myself. We went to Venezuela because my grandmother and aunt were already in Venezuela and they said this is a country that is so similar to Cuba. The people are so similar to, to the Cubans and there's a big future there. So we, instead of going to the States, like many uh, Cubans did, we went straight to Venezuela. Over one million Cubans have fled the island to find refugee in the United States. Only in 1980, 125,000 Cubans reached the coasts of Florida. Every day, Cubans keep trying to escape the island in poorly equipped vessels, risking their lives in the pursuit of liberty. A similar exodus took place in the southern cone during the second half of the 20th century. Thousands of middle-class Chileans and Argentinians fled to democratic countries from the military dictatorships of Augusto Pinochet in Chile and Jorge Videla and Leopoldo Galtieri in Argentina. In Argentina, more than 30,000 people disappeared between 1976 and 1983 during the so-called Dirty War, waged by the dictators against political dissidents. When Pinochet left office, 40% of Chileans were below poverty. So poverty was widespread. The benefits of the economic growth were concentrated in the hands of a few. And that's a real problem when you want to have democracy. If the benefits of wealth are concentrated in the hands of a few, then we will see inevitably the emergence of populist leaders who say, well, we'll take from the wealthy and we'll give to the poor. There is an inevitable link between dictatorships and social stagnation. During the last 100 years, Latin America has been the birthplace of demagoguery, empty promises and hand out only work, if at all, for a brief period of time. But they never solve the deep-seated problems of poverty, poor health, and poor education in Latin America. Accountability and transparency in the management of public funds rapidly disappear, while the demagogue demands total loyalty and obedience to his, her rule. Poverty in Latin America has been used as an excuse by demagogues of the right or the left uh, in order to gain power, uh, speaking in the name of the people, in the name of the poor, and then when they gain power, all they do is oppress the poor and they stand on the shoulders of the poor uh, as long as they can. And uh, that's typical of all uh, uh, Latin American caudillos uh, 
They believe that uh, they have the solution to all the problems. Chavez is certainly not a solution. It's much more part of the problem than part of the solution. But I would say that Chavez represents much more a symptom of what's happening and what has historically happened in Latin America than, a, than the problem himself. What we should really look into is how they can change the institutions and consolidate democracy in such a way as not to have the Chavez kind anymore. Conocí al presidente Chávez cuando no era presidente ni soñaba hacerlo en el año 1992 a raíz del golpe de estado donde él participó como uno de los líderes. Nosotros acá en Caracas no logramos controlar el poder. Ustedes lo hicieron muy bien por allá, pero ya es tiempo de evitar más derramamiento de sangre y yo ante el país y ante ustedes asumo la responsabilidad de este movimiento militar bolivariano y formé parte del grupo de abogados que en ese momento nos encargamos de la defensa de estos oficiales. Chávez es un dictador militar, él usa un uniforme, él usa lenguaje militar, instituciones, tácticas para mantener el poder, él tiene mucho dinero, él está armando a sí mismo y a sus seguidores a los dientes, According to the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, Chavez is acquiring four times the amount of weapons that he needs for his own defense, for the nation's defense. Um, he is expansionist. We know he supported the FARC. He never wanted to be an elected leader. He's not interested in elected leadership. His, his plan was for a junta. His plan for it was for a military takeover where he instructs people how to think, not where he reflects their opinions like in a democracy. President Hugo Chavez comes uh, from what President Lula himself described as an authoritarian tradition. So uh, for him, uh, it is probably more difficult to uh, accept that people will not follow uh, uh, every one of his commands. Like Hugo Chavez, Perón, Velasco Alvarado, Trujillo, Noriega, did not have outstanding military careers, but had the audacity to take up arms against established, often ineffective, governments. Uh, we have 45 million uh, Hispanic Americans in the United States today. That's a great contribution to the United States. They produced $1 trillion of income in uh, 2006. At the same time, you know, we lose productivity because so many people are migrating um, without documents. They're off the books. And that creates a whole series of inefficiencies in the U.S. economy. Having people who are here allows us to continue to grow at a pretty good rate. But it, having them off the books means that people aren't able to invest in their education, the education of their children. They aren't as free to switch jobs. The Hispanic Americans are taking advantage of a system that believes in private property, believes in education, believes in law, and, and they can get into the system and they can start crawling up the system. And you can find Hispanics everywhere. They're in all neighborhoods and so on. They're integrating into the society. The birth and rise of the main Colombian terrorist group, the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, FARC, offers a terrifying example of the destructive powers of extremist political ideology. They've been fighting for socialism a long time, but uh, they've sort of uh, kept fighting even though the goal of socialism has faded away. And they've gotten very busy with the uh, drug uh, industry and the kidnapping industry. The FARC um, has been placed on the list of terrorist groups by the United States, by the European Union. Um, throughout Latin America, there's been a reluctance to attach that label. But with, I think, the exception of the Venezuelan government, um, there is no government in the hemisphere um, that, that is sympathetic to or supportive um, of the FARC. Today, there are 1.5 million Colombians living in Venezuela. Unfortunately, many members of the FARC also find refuge in Venezuela due to the political alignment between Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez and the terrorist organization. Venezuela has been described as a getaway to heaven by drug enforcement authorities. 
This is due to the absence of border controls to drug trafficking. Arrests made by Venezuelan authorities for drug trafficking have decreased from 12,000 in 1998 to about 1,000 in 2008. Although the Venezuelan government claims they are active in anti-drug trafficking activities, the fact is that the movement of cocaine through the country has been increasing significantly. Their search has included Venezuela, where now at least 20, perhaps 25 percent of all the refined cocaine that moves into uh, the world market passes through Venezuelan territory rather than up the Pacific border. Most of the Venezuelan trade um, goes through Venezuela and on to Europe, which pays three times the amount of money that is being paid in a relatively stable cocaine market in the United States. But Venezuela is getting caught up in it. There's no evidence that President Chavez has personally been involved or benefited from it, but the corruption factor among the police and military in Venezuela, brought on by their growing involvement in the transport of Colombian cocaine across Venezuelan territory and then across the Atlantic into Europe, is a hugely negative event, and it's clear that the Chavez government has not mm, paid enough attention to that problem. It has tolerated, if it hasn't connived directly um, with it, and this is a problem that Venezuela is going to have to confront. Half of the British consumption of cocaine is already supplied from Venezuela. The drug traffickers are establishing links with international terrorism. This is the case with Mexican drug cartels that receive drugs from Venezuela and help Iranian terrorists, also coming through Venezuela and having false Venezuelan documents in their way to the United States. Today, there are daily direct flights between Iran and Venezuela, loaded with people who are no ordinary tourists. United States authorities suspect the presence in those flights of terrorist elements traveling from Iran and entering the United States with false documents provided by Venezuelan authorities. As the security climate in Colombia has improved, um, the economy has also gotten much stronger. There's a tremendous dynamism. There's a lot of investment, not only Colombian investment, but foreign investment. And I think that is one of the reasons that the Colombian government has been so keen on, um, on signing a free trade agreement with the United States and having that agreement passed by the U.S. Congress to, uh, to put it really into effect. As the Colombian situation generally improves, more Colombians are returning home. There is no doubt that given the appropriate social, economic, and political environment in a country, its citizens will prefer to stay at home rather than living as exiles in foreign countries. While good news is coming from Colombia, the Venezuelan situation is not positive. Crime is rampant and corruption in government is at an all-time high. The combination of very high oil income and lack of accountability and transparency has produced a level of corruption that has never been seen before in the country, one that can properly be defined as hyper-corruption. After receiving over $700 billion in 10 years to manage a country with only 25 million people, the government has not been able to solve any of the basic problems of the Venezuelan poor. And I remember that when he first came into power, he said, if I don't save the children of the streets, if you see one kid still living on the streets, I will change my name. He still is called Hugo Chavez. But I'm convinced that the only one who can govern this country in this moment in which we are living is called Hugo Chavez Frias. Therefore, all of the main decisions, and even the non-important decisions in Venezuela, have to be taken by Hugo Chavez himself. Chavez was supposed to be against poverty, but actually he's been an institutional uh, power for poverty and corruption. He's a romantic. He's a utopian. He's a, he's, he, uh, he's a megalomaniacal character. El problema es 
cuando es un ser humano quien pretende influir económica, política y socialmente en la cultura, en la idiosincrasia, en la historia, en la vida de ciudadanos que no tienen nada que ver con él, que es el caso de Hugo Chávez. La situación de Bolivia es una situación sumamente dramática. El que ha ido a Bolivia sabe que existen dos Bolivias. La Bolivia de Evo Morales, que trata de vender un nacionalismo indígena, y la Bolivia del progreso, que es toda el área que se llama, que es conocida como la media luna, lo que estamos viendo en el Ecuador. En el Ecuador en este momento se está exaltando mucho la figura del presidente Correa, pero todo el mundo que vive en Ecuador sabe que la inflación en Ecuador es galopante, que el desempleo es exactamente igual y que lo que trata el presidente Correa es de emular, de copiar lo que está sucediendo en Venezuela. A program of handouts, free food, free education, free primary health services has only given the poor an illusion of prosperity. What did he do with all of this money? And, and did poverty go away? Uh, as you want to say, no. Uh, we know from his own accounts, uh, since 2004, he has spent or committed $110 billion in uh, primarily in about 30 countries, uh, some of them in, uh, most of them in Latin America, but all over the world, Middle East and Asia. Um, in order to um, ad advance his revolution, um, that $110 billion has been withdrawn out of the uh, country while poverty went up and, and all of the other indexes went up. About $40 billion have been distributed among ideological friends of the so-called revolution in Latin America, including Evo Morales in Bolivia, Nestor Kirchner in Argentina, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, and Rafael Correa in Ecuador. About $20 billion have been given to Fidel Castro. Transparency International has Venezuela as one of the most uh, corrupt uh, uh, countries in the world, certainly one of the most corrupt uh, in Latin America. And one of the big problems in Latin America is that we don't really have a very strong, independent, autonomous, and accountable judiciary. And that generates problems because it's very difficult to enforce laws that already exist against corruption when the judiciary is not very clean, when the, judiciary, when the judicial system is prone to corruption. In 1999, Chavez managed to eliminate all democratic institutions in the country, replacing them with unconditional followers. <laughs> Yo no voy a permitir en ningún puesto de recolección firme contra mi comandante en jefe, contra el hombre más grande de esta patria, contra el mesías de esta tierra, contra el hombre más bueno que nunca tuvo la patria. Quien lo haga, o me matan a mí o yo los mato a él. As soon as he got into power, was he called for a, a constituent assembly in order to rewrite or to write a new constitution. Only a few institutions remained partially independent, including the oil company Petróleos de Venezuela. Chávez needed to control this company that provides the country with most of the foreign currency earnings. Y fuimos algunos de ellos, siete en total, despedidos públicamente por el ciudadano presidente de la República en su programa Aló Presidente número 101, el día domingo 7 de diciembre, y además encadenó tanto a la televisión pública como privada y a todos los medios radiales y televisivos a ese mensaje. El mensaje era claro, aquellos que están en contra del gobierno de Hugo Chávez serán justamente execrados, no importa si están dentro de una empresa del Estado o no importa dónde se encuentran, no solamente de los trabajadores petroleros, de sus familias que entendían que quedarnos callados, quedarnos de brazos cruzados o ocultar lo que estaba ocurriendo en el país iba a ser justamente la desgracia para el futuro, porque igualmente sus planes los iba a consolidar. Offside, afuera. Muchas gracias por su servicio. Señor Juan Fernández está despedido de Petróleos de Venezuela. Horacio Medina, afuera. 
Yo no tengo problema de rasparlos a toditos si a toditos hubiera que rasparlo. En 2002, he provoked a crisis in this company and managers and technicians went on strike. And this strike was supported by much of the nation. Del 2 de diciembre para ejecutar el paro cívico nacional. En el año 2002 y 2003, eh, siendo presidente y vicepresidente de Cámara, tuve que asumir un rol en el sector empresarial, eh, a, ya que la situación política así lo ameritaba. Y bueno, el enfrentamiento contra Chávez, este, por, por las leyes, la, la forma de gobernar que quería imponer a, a Venezuela, este, llevó a, al clima, a la situación en donde ya conocemos los hechos del 11 de abril del 2002. In April 11, 2002, almost one million Venezuelans marched in Caracas, siding with the petroleum company managers who were defending the autonomy of the company from politicization at the hands of the government. As the public moved against him, and as he's tried to take over PDVSA, the national oil company, uh, there was a strike of meritocracy against the military guys coming in and running the oil company. This march attempted to reach the presidential headquarters at Miraflores, but in the way, at Puente Yaguno, they were met by gunfire from Chavez's followers. <laughs> Thirteen marchers were killed and dozens were wounded, including several journalists who were covering the march. solicitó al señor presidente de la república la renuncia de su cargo, la cual aceptó. And he turned that into a coup by the United States, which wasn't paying attention, so it got blamed for that uh, ever since. On April 12, the president of Fede Cámaras, Pedro Carmona, took the oath of office to replace Chávez as temporary president. He issued an unconstitutional decree eliminating the National Assembly and behaved in a generally illegal manner. Carlos Ortega, the president of the Federation of Labor Unions, withdrew his support. The Organization of the American States, meeting in haste, did not recognize the new provisional government. Looting and riots erupted during April 12 and 13, and some members of the army, led by General Raúl Baduel, reinstalled Hugo Chávez in power. It was badly handled by some of the main actors, which led to the return of Hugo Chávez to the presidency. 23,000 managers and technicians of the petroleum company were dismissed in violation of existing Venezuelan labor laws that demand that each employee be given specific reasons for dismissal and that every employee should receive severance payment. Almost seven years later, they have not been given severance payments, while many have not even received their personal savings, which are being illegally retained by the government. Thousands of these skilled men and women are now in exile, since they are included in a black list that prohibits them from working in their country. The government has ordered all petroleum contractors that the men and women who rebelled against him cannot be given employment by private companies working for the Venezuelan oil industry. The production of oil in Venezuela has declined by over 35% since Chavez came into power. I mean, it takes a lot of, takes a lot of incompetence to kill the goose that lays the golden egg, but he's managed to do that. Upon his return to power, Hugo Chavez became more dictatorial. Institutional checks and balances disappeared. He created a vague political philosophy called socialism of the 21st century. En Venezuela se abusa, se abusa muchísimo del uso de la imagen del libertador y siempre el presidente Chávez y su gobierno 
tratan de utilizar y de justificar sus acciones contrarias a la Constitución y las leyes, siempre señalando que eso obedecía a dictámenes del libertador. Chávez es seen in two different ways. One is this very dangerous way is this demagogue who's anti-democratic, who's who is acquiring all political power around him. Uh, the executive, the legislative, the judiciary, the military, the electoral commission, all of this. Who, in, on top of that, is an ideologue you know, who promotes an ideology that very few people understand, that he calls Bolivarian, uh, that is really socialist, that is probably communist, uh, that has nothing to do with Simón Bolívar, who's probably turning over in his grave. Habría que imaginarse entonces a un libertador Simón Bolívar capaz de hacer listas en donde colocar a sus enemigos para no darles ni siquiera en, los, en la posibilidad del ejercicio más elemental de su derecho constitucional, el derecho a elegir o el derecho a estudiar o el derecho al trabajo. El que firme contra Chávez, ahí quedará su nombre registrado para la historia porque va a tener que poner su nombre, su apellido y su firma y su número de cédula y su huella digital. The regime already has five TV channels about 35 regional community TV, more than 500 radio stations, community stations, about 75 newspapers and community magazines. The regime also decides when to go into TV radio national linkage with all private media. Debo decirles que estamos en cadena nacional de radio y televisión. En cadena nacional de radio y de televisión. Cadena nacional de radio y televisión. Para decirle a toda Venezuela en cadena nacional de radio y televisión lo que aquí... In early 2007, the regime closed down Radio Caracas Televisión. No habrá nueva concesión para ese canal golpista de televisión que se llamó Radio Caracas Televisión. Nosotros tenemos el derecho indubitable, legal, garantizado en la Constitución de operar hasta el 12 de junio del año 2022. Ya está redactado la medida, así que vayan preparándose, apagando los equipos, pues. No se va a tolerar aquí ningún medio de comunicación que esté al servicio del golpismo. Radio Caracas was the, the TV network that was in every single corner of the country. Contra el pueblo, contra la nación, contra la independencia nacional, contra la dignidad de la república. Venezuela se respeta. The poorest people were able to see only Radio Caracas Television, their soap operas, their novelas, their, their, their comedy shows, their musicals. I mean, it was, that network really was aimed more towards the, 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 you know, towards the, the whole country, but more towards the middle class and lower class. When he closed Radio Caracas Television, I think that was the first step for the majority of the poor people to realize who he really was. To deny the extension of the concession to Radio Caracas Televisión was discriminatory and violated Article 13 of the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights that requires equal treatment for all. Radio Caracas Televisión was never officially charged with any violations of the laws. The concession for Radio Caracas Televisión was the only one that was cancelled, a clearly discriminatory situation. Nosotros tenemos derecho a que se respete la propiedad de los bienes que hemos adquirido legítimamente con el fruto del esfuerzo de cinco generaciones de accionistas que han pasado por esta empresa. Provea and Espacio Público, two Venezuelan human rights organizations, reported six deaths related to the exercise of journalism in Venezuela during 2006, as well as 188 violations of freedom of expression by the government during the same year, 69% more than in 2005. 36 cases of violence against journalists committed by the Venezuelan regime are currently before the Human Rights Commission of the Organization of American States. Not only journalists are persecuted by the Chavez regime. Today, there are more than 30 political dissidents in prison without proper trial. Venezuela Awareness Foundation, a nonprofit organization located in Miami, 
has repeatedly denounced the extensive human rights violations to individuals, torture under the Chavez regime. El gobierno de Chávez utiliza el poder judicial para perseguir y encarcelar en forma selectiva a los venezolanos por causas políticas para enviar una señal opresiva, amenazadora y represiva a los venezolanos. Uno de los tantos casos de los presos políticos venezolanos que hemos seguido en nuestra organización Venezuela Warners como representantes legales es el del estudiante universitario Raúl Díaz. Tiene casi cinco años preso por un delito que no cometió. La OEA tuvo que intervenir para que se le pudiera salvaguardar su integridad porque se lo estaban dejando morir simplemente por ser un estudiante que alzó su voz a nombre de la libertad de Venezuela. El caso del capitán del ejército, Otto Gebauer, quien custodió al presidente Chávez en sus horas fuera del poder el 11 de abril del 2002, fue testigo de excepción de ver llorar a Chávez y por esto fue torturado y condenado a 12 años de cárcel por el supuesto delito de detención ilegítima del presidente Chávez, quien en realidad había renunciado. El caso de la juez Lourdes Safiuni, quien observó serias irregularidades legales en contra del preso político Eligio Cedeño. Ella acató una orden de la ONU y le otorgó libertad condicional. Y el presidente Chávez en cadena nacional ordenó el encarcelamiento de la juez con pena máxima, no de 30, sino de 35 años. No hay nada que conecte al preso político con el delito que se le acusa. For me it's very important to help somehow with my voice the political prisoners that are exist in Venezuela. For me it's very important to speak up because I see the children of my friends, I see the children of my nephews and nieces growing up in a country where they're going to be indoctrinated. And I can't accept that. Se habla por allí, por ejemplo, de algunos voceros, de algunos sectores, de una amnistía selectiva. Amnistía. Ni selectiva ni nada. No hay perdón para nadie. Los traidores, traidores son. No pueden volver ni van a volver. That Venezuela is gone. It, you, I can't tell you how bad that situation is. It has almost, uh, you know, changed the climate of the, of the, uh, of the country. Uh, one third of them used to be in the middle class. The middle class is down to 5%. And what we're dealing with now is like we have a huge, huge problem. I think that Chavez is a danger for his own people. I don't really think he is a danger to the United States because uh, the United States really has primarily a need for oil and uh, he has a great desire to sell oil. So our needs are very compatible in that regard. Uh, some American corporations may lose some money, but you know that's a risk that they took. I think that uh, the problem is that he is selling people on promises that aren't going to work, that uh, he doesn't really have. In terms of, of uh, tools and education and, and refitting and retraining uh, people because they've been fooled so badly, they're, you know, we're, we're, turning, we're turning them all into pessimists, both the opposition and the Chavistas are becoming total pessimists. They're throwing their hands up saying, there's no, you, we can't win with Savior, we can't win with Satan, we can't win, you know, they, they feel that they have no, no future. When people give up like that, um, that's pessimism, that's inertia, that's uh, depression, and um, psychological and economic. For several years, International public opinion seemed to accept the democratic nature of the Venezuelan government due to the several elections held in the country. What most people abroad have finally understood is that these elections were held in an environment characterized by massive abuse of power by the regime. <laughs> Y ustedes ven en tres años que yo no he servido para nada, ustedes me pueden sacar por un referéndum. Esa es democracia. Bueno, pero ya veremos, ¿ah? ¿eh? Esa es una prueba para mí. Y eso es muy bueno. 
Ellos dicen que me van a sacar por un referéndum. Me. All elections held in Venezuela during the last years have been deeply contaminated by the government's systematic constitutional violations and abuse of power, executed under the indifferent eyes of the National Electoral Council, an organization that should be impartial but is instead under Chavez's total political control. I think he's a real danger to the people in Venezuela also because he is not really committed to the rule of law to a democratic system. Un traidor no puede estar en un cargo de confianza. Y este estado tiene una política y una correspondencia con el gobierno que tiene, donde no hay espacio para los traidores. ¿Cuántos serían más o menos? Los que sean necesarios. Los que hayan firmado están votados. The characteristics of the process and the mechanisms utilized by Hugo Chavez to become an autocratic ruler in Venezuela have been very similar to the one used by Alberto Fujimori to become an authoritarian president in Peru. Basically what you see is that dictators are learning how to use the rule of law to escape scrutiny of what used to be outright unlawful. So in the case of Fujimori, he presented it as though it were a, a democratic thing, that people he had popular support. He also used the high level of societal fear of the Sendero Luminoso to gain that support. And he did a lot of things, and he did it using the law. So that gives the appearance of democratic person, of a democratic leader as opposed to an outright dictator. But little by little, when you see that laws are used to violate basic rights, you begin to pause and question and, and ask yourself, is this truly a democratic government or is this a dictator? And that's what occurred in Peru over time, that people began to say, wait a minute, it looks like a democracy, but in reality, it's not. Fujimori remained in power 10 years, while Chavez is still in power after a decade. Both presidents dissolved Congress and the judicial system in their countries, promoted a new constitution, progressively eliminated institutional checks and balances, and enlisted the support of the armed forces for their increasingly authoritarian regimes. Fujimori and Chavez closed down dissident media, newspapers, and TV stations. They survived military rebellions, both attempted unlimited re-elections while allowing very high levels of government corruption. Fujimori's government finally collapsed due to corruption, while Chavez's regime is now highly weakened due to financial mismanagement and rampant corruption. In Peru, Sendero Luminoso and the Peruvian army became engaged in a cruel struggle that took 50,000 lives and drove thousands of Peruvians away from their country. In the United States, the number of Peruvian immigrants doubled to about 300,000 during Fujimori's presidency, while thousands crossed the border into Ecuador and found their way north to Colombia and Venezuela. Until 1999, Venezuela was considered a very stable democracy in Latin America. But the control of two political parties since the defeat of the military dictator Perez Jimenez had become more and more corrupted and degenerated. Venezuelans simply dealt with those problems the best they could. Venezuelans did not immigrate. The currency was strong, the economy was supported by oil income, and people found no economic or political reasons to abandon their country. In 2000, there were 125,000 Venezuelans living in the United States. Eight years later, there are over 600,000, some 300,000 in Florida alone. The social profile of these immigrants is similar to the Cuban immigration during the early years of Castro's dictatorial rule. Professionals, business persons, and middle class. 
Obviously, the main driving force behind the Venezuelan exodus has so far been political. Although, as it also happened in Cuba, the economic component is increasing as Venezuelan social and economic conditions deteriorate. After 10 years of rule, he has managed, among other things, to pilfer $700 billion and has ruined the economy of the nation by putting the state-owned petroleum company at the service of his political project. The search for freedom, democracy, and opportunities to lead a better life is driving millions of Latin Americans away from the region to more advanced countries. Spain, Canada, the United States, and some European countries such as Italy, from where many of their ancestors came during the past century. If you look at what the, the socialists and the, and the communists, I mean, talking about the radical socialists, uh, and communists have done to the countries where they have um, uh, taken control, is they've created more poverty, they've institutionalized corruption, and uh, they have increased the gap between the rich and the poor. Just the opposite of what they said they were going to do. But they don't get blamed for it. Why? These leaders always create an outside enemy. And that outside enemy has always been the United States. In cualquier escenario, estaremos con Irán. Como estaremos con Cuba. Yo lo he dicho, si el Estados Unidos llegara a invadir Cuba, aquí correría sangre venezolana también. No sería, tendrían que invadir a Venezuela también, a los dos. The way Chavez uh, insists, for 25 times, he has, uh, uh, since 2004, he has claimed that the United States is assassinating him. He has a 25 plots in which he said, you know, the U.S. is going to invade and so on. So they need the outside uh, threat in order to get people to be distracted from the fact that there's no milk, there's no sugar, there's no rice, there's no, no beans, there's no coffee, there's no jobs. There are shortages of food in a country as rich as Venezuela, a country with very small population density, enormous arable land resources, and many other resources. Venezuela, I know Venezuela pretty well. I've traveled throughout. I was ambassador there for, for three years, over three years, almost three and a half years. I visited every uh, state of Venezuela, and it, it, is, it is not only a beautiful country, it is a wealthy country. It, highest inflation in Latin America, you have like uh, the worst um, uh, corruption and the worst highest homicide rates. The homicide rates in, some, in uh, Caracas are higher than they are in Baghdad. Um, but when I think about the Venezuelan people with, uh, after, after Chavez is gone, um, I, you know, I, uh, I lament. So he is not only going to be satisfied with controlling and destroying his own country, he doesn't see it as destroying, of course, he's changing, he's creating a revolution that, of course, is good for the people uh, in his own view. But he wants to expand that to other countries. You know, somebody once told me, a, a very wise person once said, be careful of anyone who speaks for the people because they are not speaking for the people. Latin Americans immigrate to the United States looking for their particular version of the American dream. For millions, this dream is not so much wealth or fame, but just the possibility of living in peace and tranquility, feeling secure and having the basic components of a decent life. I didn't want to leave Venezuela. Uh, I wanted to live there for the rest of my life. Uh, I grew up here in New York. And um, I, I, I prefer that culture to the one that, that is here. Uh, it's no, no slight against my, my mother and father and brothers and, and my whole family here, but my family is also spread around the world. And I found it one of the most exciting, uh, you know, interesting uh, familial 
places um, to, uh, to, to work and, and play and think um, on Earth, uh, notwithstanding the, the best climate in the world, no? What the Venezuelans need is moral support from the outside. They need the democracies, the Western democracies of North America, Europe, Latin America, putting a spotlight on Venezuela, on Chavez's actions. Whenever he commits an undemocratic action to highlight it, to divulge it, to tell the whole world, as happened, for example, when he shut down RCTV. I am a big believer that if we keep fighting, and if we get together and we are united somehow, we're gonna kick him out. It's hard, but it's not impossible. And we have a long way to go, but we're doing something about it. And that's all we can do. Somos una generación que no descansará hasta que seamos el país que podemos ser y la sociedad que debemos ser. Una generación que luchará hoy, mañana y siempre por ser libres y verdaderamente humanistas. Soñamos con un país donde podamos ser tomados en cuenta sin tener que estar uniformados. Sesores 